Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, December 20th, 2020, and this is our Advent 4 service, um, also known as Christmas Sunday, as we uh, get ready to celebrate Christmas this week uh, with you as well. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, thank publicly our three uh, very faithful servant singers, uh, Jane Irwin, Barb Hutton, and Mary Muir. And uh, the three of them have been uh, between them here every week uh, pretty well since we started doing this back in March, whenever that was. And uh, uh, I was thinking how even though uh, COVID time has just been such weird time, it's still, it has flown. I can't believe it's already towards the end of December. A couple of things for you to know uh, for our Christmas Eve service. Uh, two things. One is we're going to have communion again, and for that, you will need to get your own things ready. So some juice and some bread just to have ready for that service uh, on Christmas Eve. And uh, any time after 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve, you can tune in, and uh, especially if you've got little ones that you might want to watch uh, some of it with, um, we'd like it to be available to you. Now, uh, one other thing is that we are not taping or producing services for December 27th and for January 3rd. And uh, uh, that's just to give everybody a little bit of a break, a little bit of a holiday, and uh, then everything gets going again for January 10th. So uh, just leaving it at that for now, and we're ready to begin our worship. David Fries has our prelude. If we were following the Oxford Book of Carols, we would start with Once in Royal David City. Guess what? That's what we're starting with. It's hymn number 62 in Voices United, Once in Royal David City.
Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent and our celebration of the Christ child. On Christmas Eve, we'll remember the details of the nativity, but today, let us draw our attention to the larger picture. A babe born in the dark of night in a strange place, surrounded by only the poor and the lowly. He had no titles to his name. He received no inheritance of nobility. He did not command an army, but chose love and forgiveness as his superpowers. He did not set up a regime, nor did he institute a religion, but he became Lord and Savior for countless millions. He had no rights. He owned no property. He never traveled abroad. Yet this man was a champion for human rights and brought hope and healing to all those who had lived under the thumb of oppression for generations. He taught us how to live. Then he showed by his example. His ethic was one of love, his gospel, kindness, and peace. Friends, this man left his spirit in us. He gave to us some of his superpowers. He prompted us to live his way. Even now, after 2,000 years, his spirit blows in us as strong as it did on the day of Pentecost. Surely our world needs this spirit still. So may this spirit be born in us again today, right now at this moment. And let today really be the first day, the birthing day of the rest of our lives. Amen. just in case I have a little trouble uh, lighting the Advent candles. It's the fourth Sunday of Advent, so we'll begin by lighting our first three candles. And again, if you're doing this at home, just you can do it along with me. It is said that Superman had 17 superpowers. We know about speed, he's faster than a speeding bullet, and of course his X-ray vision, his strength, and his invulnerability. But did you know that he also had super breath? That he could create a hurricane with his breath, but also inhale enough breath to the point where he could travel underwater or even in outer space. But one thing that is never claimed of Superman, that his powers are available to all people, to the average Joe or Jane like you or me. So these fantastic powers which could change the world are given only to him, only to the one. And so this is the difference with the powers we celebrate in Jesus Christ. His greatest powers, love, forgiveness, mercy, and justice, are available to all of us. In fact, they have already been given to us. They live in us, waiting for activation, waiting to be born again, to coin a phrase. If today you were filled with the power of love or forgiveness or mercy or justice, what would you do with such power? How would the world change forever because of you exercising those powers? And so on this fourth Sunday of Advent, let us remember that the birth of Christ is not a once in history event. It's not just a yearly remembrance at the end of December either. It's a daily recurrence, a daily breath of spirit, a daily dose of the superpower of love. This is a gift not to be taken for granted. So as we light the fourth candle, this is the candle for love. The greatest superpower on earth. Now let us pray. As we light this candle, commemorating the power of love, forgiveness, 
mercy, justice, compassion. We pray for a world in need of such gifts. We lift our hearts and offer love to the stranger passing by on the street. We lift our hearts and offer forgiveness to one we might rather not. We lift our hearts and offer mercy to those who are unaware of their actions. We lift our hearts and we offer compassion to those who are suffering, even those closest to us. We remember with love those who are sick or grieving or lost this day. O oh God, come into our hearts and blow your holy breath upon the pilot light of our love. We pray in the light of Christ. Amen. And now we'll conclude our candle lighting liturgy with the singing of a hymn from More Voices. It's number 71, and it's called When the Wind of Winter Blows. It's probably not one that you know, but enjoy listening to the words as our three uh, choristers sing it for you. When the Wind of Winter Blows. <laughs> Let's bring our hearts and voices together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, before we go any further, I wanted to invite Mark Worthington to come to the front of the church. Mark wears a number of hats here at uh, Ansley. And in fact, he was the one who hired me to come here way back in January. And uh, I'll be moving on after today. And uh, he wanted to say a few words. So Mark, please come forward. Reverend John, you came to us at an unprecedented time in our history here at Annesley. A lot of our congregation never got a chance to meet you and you them, and yet you soldiered on and have been here for us, and uh, I can't thank you enough for that. 
So on behalf of all of the congregation here at Anna's Lee, we wish you well and we thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mark, and it has been a pleasure. I have learned so much. Uh, I've learned a lot of things that I maybe didn't know I needed to know, but I've really enjoyed my time here, so thank you. Thank you. Well, we really thought it would be a, a good idea to let you sing a, a few Christmas carols today. We'll be singing more on Christmas Eve, of course, but today we're going to sing three uh, in a row. The first one is Angels We Have Heard on High, uh, number 38. The second one, uh, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear, number 44. And the last one, uh, The First Noel. So just a couple verses of each of those, and I'm sure you'll be able to sing along.
That was some great singing, and I especially like the descant on the first Noel. Thank you very much. Our scripture today is probably uh, one of the most famous Christmas scriptures. Uh, it's actually probably one of the most famous scriptures of all time. And it is from the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, one Sunday, many moons ago, I preached a sermon on that other most famous uh, scripture reading, 1 Corinthians 13, the famous passage you all know from weddings where it ends with, and the greatest of these is love. And of course, being a minister, I waxed on about love, as ministers tend to do. After the sermon, a woman came to speak to me in my office. She said, I have a problem that love can't fix. She explained that years earlier, her sister had been murdered, and it was the sister's husband who had committed the crime. Her family was ripped apart and turned upside down and filled with grief and pain. Now the guy went to jail and did his time. He got out. And it turns out that some of the family wanted to welcome him back into the fold and invite him to family Christmas and Thanksgiving celebrations. But others, like my parishioner that day, couldn't bear the thought of sitting beside him at Christmas dinner. She claimed, love has its limits. And I knew that whatever answer I gave her that day would have the power to either heal her or make the rest of her life an unforgivable mess. So let me ask you, what would you have said to her? Is there a limit to love? The Christmas story would tell us no, that our God is a God of unconditional love. And when we receive that, we too are full of unconditional love. But can our human lives, with all our human foibles, ever hope to match the divine call to love? Oh, maybe love is a continuum, an expansive force that we grow into over time as we evolve as a species. That could be true, but who has the time? Who has the time to wait for hearts to learn to love or to learn to forgive or to be healed? My experience is that most families that have experienced this kind of trauma or grief, sometimes unspeakable, just are not ever going to get over it, nor probably should they. But then, how do we find meaning and hope when our families are torn apart? Love is only meaningful if it has agency 
or the power to transform lives. Forgive me for saying this, but in my experience, most Christian love is not unconditional and often seems self-serving. Well, I had this lovely person in my office, and as she fought to hold back tears, sometimes we just have to let other people do the loving, I said. I said, maybe you're not able to do that, and you just have to allow other people. But that wasn't the problem. The real problem was that she was feeling guilty and ashamed for not being able to love. And so... We talked for a little bit, and then I said, why don't you come back in two or three weeks and we'll talk about it again, the old buying for time trick. But she didn't do it, and in fact, I never saw her again. So over the years, I have often wondered what ever happened in her situation. What do you think happened to her? Perhaps you know of the story of Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl was incarcerated in a Nazi prison camp and put on a hard labor crew. And by that is meant that the prisoners were forced to walk for miles through deep snow and dense forest without proper footwear or clothing, only to be told to dig a ditch and then at the end of the day to return and walk back all the way the same way. Day after day, surely the point was to squash any meaning or hope to dehumanize and even to desacralize those prisoners. Oh, it wouldn't take much. I would be one of those who would quickly lose hope, who perhaps at least in the beginning would have prayed that maybe God could intervene or God could send help or God could fix the hatred in the human heart that led people to commit such acts only to realize that God does not intervene this way. Else God would have intervened a number of times in the history of humanity. And life really was, as Leo Tolstoy would write, meaningless and futile. But this is a Christmas sermon, and I'm thinking about Viktor Frankl, because Frankl found that he could this is a psychological term, he found that he could actualize love. And so here he is, trudging through snow and through deep forests, going off to dig a ditch. And what does he do? He finds that in his mind and in his heart, he can bring love to him. He thinks of the people who love him. He thinks of the people that he would love if he were out of prison. And he actualizes that love. He found something even more interesting, to me at least, is that he found that he could hold in his heart a number of things at the same time. This actualized love could be held at the same time as he held a kind of uh, regard for his captors, interestingly enough. And thirdly, he found that he could hold what he called meaning, which he found by holding all of these things. So here's a really interesting thing for we human beings living in the world that we live in, this COVID world, there's so much pain and suffering, but there's also so much joy and so many beautiful things that we've discovered along the way. And the people who love us and whom we love haven't stopped loving us. And so we can hold all of these things at once. Frankel's point was that our hearts are big. They're big enough, and they can hold 
all of those things. He wrote, for the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. And that truth is, love is the ultimate and highest goal to which we can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secretly secret that human poetry and human thought and human belief have to impart to us. And that is this, that the salvation of man is through love and in love. The truth is, you see, we have that capacity already born into us. And so here it is Christmas in one of the most unusual years that any of us have ever experienced for sure. And we're not being allowed to do the things that we would normally do and the things that give us joy and the things that bring us love. But what is Christmas if not the reminder that in the depths of despair and in the darkest of nights, in the times of our lives where we experience great fear or worry, those times when you don't think you can make it, or like this woman in my office, those times when you're being forced to sit at table with a person you detest for what they have done, Christmas comes and says, there will always be love. A little love is all it takes. A little love is going to be born this year again. A little love is going to find its way into the world. A little love is going to find its way into your heart. And when it finds its way into your heart, you are going to have the capacity to hold all of these things and find meaning in them. Look, I don't believe that God intervenes in our lives the way we want God to intervene, to fix everything, to make COVID go away. But I do know this, that love is the most powerful superpower on earth, and nothing can stop it from being born again and again. And if that's not from God, then I don't know where it is. Love is the elemental force of the universe. Because without it, it might seem that all we're doing is spinning around the universe on a little blue ball. For some reason, we are here. For some reason, we are conscious beings. And for some reason, it seems that without us, love can't be born into the world. And I don't mean that God can't make love be born anywhere, but... I mean that what Christ reveals to us is that God wants human hearts to be the place where love dwells. I don't know if God needs us, but I do know that God wants us. Christmas whispers to us, we are the ones who must bring God to birth. We are the ones who must bring love to birth. Everyone loves the original cartoon of the Grinch who stole Christmas. The Grinch is the personification of hatred and violence. He doesn't just hate Christmas. He hates love and any expression of it, especially as he sees it in the little Who's down in Whoville. Remember that song? You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. You're a monster. Your heart's an empty hole. Your brain is full of spiders. You have garlic in your soul. Mr. Grinch, I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot pole. And so the Grinch, after he has stolen every last gift 
from under the tree, every last little bell and ornament from every tree, including the tree itself, and every last little bit of food from the fridges of the people in Whoville, in a vain attempt, I guess, to strip away every last shred of meaning from their lives, Mr. Grinch realizes that violence and hatred and love do not change the world. They have no impact. And in the morning, what do the people of Whoville do? They come out of their houses, they join hands, and they sing songs of love to each other. You see, love is born in the worst circumstances. Love can't not be born. And so this is the power of the stories about Christ. Because even when he's absent from us, the early Christians found that they could actualize him. Right? They could kind of conjure him up, conjure at least his love, and bring that into their hearts and use that as energy with which to live their lives. And we have to remember that the New Testament was written against the backdrop of intense Roman oppression, including state-directed policies of dehumanization and desacralizing the lives of people. Now, the Gospel of John was penned even later than that, long after the troops had come and raised the city of Jerusalem to, to a rubble, and long after all the early Christians were arrested and carted off to Rome and fed to the lions in the Colosseum there. I consider that perhaps from his vantage point, John could see that it would not be long before this, this new way, this Jesus, the Christ way, was going to die out. So he wisely tells the story in order to give access to the power of an actualized Christ. This is where the power of the gospel resides. He places the birth of Jesus not in Bethlehem, but in the cosmos. Here in John's gospel, there's no virgin birth, there's no shepherds quaking, no angels singing, even though, of course, we all love those parts of the story which are found in the other gospels. But the importance of the Christ, this actualized divine love, is what he's talking about. Not the human being of Christ, but what he represented, what we now call the universal Christ, as many people are describing it these days. The gospel reflects the experience of Christians who came alive with the universal Christ, alive with spirit, alive with love. And it was said of the early Christians, look how they love each other as if that was a completely strange to do. Well, if, my friends, it really was a completely strange to do because back then, loving your neighbor was seen as a radical act. Loving outside your tribe was absolutely unheard of. Having a love for all beings, completely unthinkable. For John, the actualizing of the Christ was not a once-in-a-lifetime event. The Word became flesh and dwells among us. Right? So the power that is evident here in, the wor in this, these words is that when we actualize the Christ, his love dwells in us and with us. That spark of life that is in us, it's part of our DNA. Maybe it goes back to cosmic dust back from the Big Bang, I'm not sure. But that little piece of us comes back, roaring back to life. And so the early Christians began to see in Jesus, the man, this 
imparting of divine spirit, presence, present since the beginning, John says, and this cosmic power of love is born again in you. At Christmas, that's what it's for. Oh, I like the presents and the parties, and I love being Santa. But that's not what it's all about, is it? It's about the birth of love in the human heart because our world can't survive without it. For centuries, the church missed the message. For centuries, we were schooled to see that this divine imparting of the human spirit, uh, of the divine spirit, I, I mean, rested only in one person, in Jesus, in the Christ. It happened once and would never happen again until or when the Christ could come again at the end of time. That's early Christian teaching. But here's the thing. If we are to think that the divine spirit will only come again at the end of time and that love will be born again into our world only once more and that at the end of time, then that's just not good enough, is it, for us? Because it renders all of us, all of our lives, meaningless and futile, just like Tolstoy said. I don't want to live in a world where love, this love from the cosmic realm, this divine spirit that comes alive in us, I don't want to live in a world where that love is allowed to reign only twice, and those two times not when I'm alive. I want to live in a world that comes out of its homes every morning and joins hands in a global chorus and sings a love for all beings, not just some. A love that takes into account all of creation. Every last little bit, including the spiders in the Grinch's brain. I think the future of our Earth literally depends on it. The thing is, we have to actualize it, right? to bring that love into ourselves and live as if it is true, to pull the energy of the divine out of the cosmic field and live with it in our hearts. It's a gift. It's the best Christmas gift. And it's not for nothing. It will help us mend the world. May it be so. Amen. Well, our last hymn is number 64 in Voices United. It's O Little Town of Bethlehem. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
Just before we uh, finish our service today, I just want to uh, acknowledge that um, while I have had quite a good time learning about um, producing YouTube church, um, it's not my skill set, obviously, and it depends very much on all of the people behind the camera. So I really want to make sure that we thank David Tonks and his best person, Carol Worden, and uh, Tim Riley, who does all of our sound for us, and uh, of course, our organist and friend, David Fries. Thank you all very much for helping, uh, helping me get through this particular part of uh, the COVID experience, and uh, I wish you all the best in uh, the next part of the journey. Friends, a very simple benediction. It is go and be love for the world. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours always. Amen. And now we'll finish with our postlude. Mm -hmm.